Thank you, Morley. Um, so the next portion, the next M of the four M's, is actually the messenger, and that is Barack Obama. One of the earliest things that we had, probably only slight argument that we had with our publisher at the beginning when we were writing our book was, and she wisely told us, <clears throat> don't get involved in who's going to win the party nominations. I mean, it's hard to believe right now, but think back a year ago, and it was hardly a foregone conclusion as to who the Democratic nominee was. Uh, at, earlier on, we thought it would be the Republicans who would have the most difficulty selecting a nominee. The Democrats, Hillary Clinton, would waltz through, and she would become very easily the nominee. Shows how these things can change. But the, the issue of who was going to get the party nominations didn't seem to make uh, didn't seem to be a particularly fruitful direction for us to go, and so our publisher told us, just don't get into that. And we really didn't very much, but we did in the very beginning of this book say, well, we're, we know that the millennial generation is going to be the crucial generation, and we do think there is one candidate who does seem to have a possibility, a very strong possibility, probability, of resonating with this particular young generation, and that happens to be Barack Obama. And even as early as the summer of 2007, when much of the rest of the public didn't know who he was, the millennial generation did. And he had a pretty solid name identification with the millennials and about a two to one positive ratio of favorable to unfavorable attitudes among the millennials. So even as early as 2007, we were able to write, as we turned our book in on July 4, 2007, that it did look like there was one candidate who had the potential of appealing to this generation. He recognized generational differences. He recognized the need for social and political unity. And he was clearly willing to use a new technology. And so while I can't say that we totally predicted that it would be Barack Obama as the Democratic nominee, we went about as far out on the limb as our, as our uh, publisher was able to let us go. And we do have some data that really suggests that Barack Obama, in fact, is voters had a chance to look at him by this time when we did this survey in September 2008. He was clearly had the, had the strength, the ability, the characteristics of what voters look for in a, in a civic era. So willing to break new ground. This is, uh, the blue is people who say that that best describes Obama, the red best describes John McCain. And you can see pretty much across the board, ability to, uh, willingness to break new ground, able to communicate and mobilize public opinion, understands the needs of the American people, able to keep the economy and guide the economy and make America prosperous. All of those, Obama had a very large lead um, among the entire, this is the entire population, far more than that among millennials, who just clearly were overwhelmingly positive toward, uh, toward Obama. The only image at this point in this particular survey that McCain led in was very slightly two or three percentage points on terrorism, keeping the, 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 uh, the country safe from terrorist attacks. But even on that issue, millennials actually preferred Obama. So very clearly, the Democrats in Barack Obama had the messenger who was going to speak to the, to the needs of, of a new era, particularly to the needs of a new generation. <clears throat> the media was also obviously a, a clear era, uh, area of, of, of success for, um, for, for Senator Obama, for now President Obama, but it isn't the first time that this has happened. In the previous two civic realignments, a new medium came along and was utilized by the winning candidate, was utilized by the winning party, and, 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 and that candidate, that party, utilized their strengths in those areas with that new medium, uh, each of the new media, to, to, uh, to, to, to realign America for the following 40 years. So in 1860, it was the rise of the telegraph. Hard to think of that as new technology, but think of things in, in the 1860s and prior to that when it, it essentially, it took, it, it took days for people to go from one place to another. It was essentially as far as they could walk or a horse could ride in a day. That's how far news could get during, during that era. So the telegraph, which, which allowed for virtually instantaneous communication, was highly revolutionary at that point. And what this led to was the creation of partisan newspapers. In the 1860s through, through the early part of the 20th century, 90% of the newspapers in the country were affiliated with one political party or another. Don't see that much today because newspapers wanted to keep their, 
uh, wanted to be able to ho hopefully advertise to both Democrats and Republicans. But in the, in the 1860s, when Abraham Lincoln was running, there were Democratic papers and there were Republican papers. And they captured, as Morley talked about, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. That was captured in the Illinois papers explicitly with very great partisan coloration. There's a wonderful story that in one particular event, Abraham Lincoln is carried off the stage by his supporters. The Republican paper says it was a triumph. He was on the shoulders of his supporters. The Democratic paper said he had fainted dead away and his, and his supporters had to drag him off the stage. But that was what Lincoln was able to use. It made Lincoln a national figure, and it allowed Lincoln and his party to basically eclipse the old political elites. By in, the, in the 1930s, it was a new technology, and that was radio. Again, hard to think of it as new technology, but at that point it was. The number of people buying radio sets increased exponentially throughout the 1920s. Even in the 1930s, in the height of the Depression, people were adding radio sets, households, in the millions per year. So they needed radios, even if they couldn't afford anything else in a sense. They made sure that they had their radios. Every home had its radio receiver. And what this allowed Roosevelt to do, because of his great presence on the radio, the fireside chats, all of that sort of thing, was allowed him to go beyond the traditional media of that era, then the newspapers, the partisan press, which was a little less partisan, but still pretty partisan, allowed him to go over the heads of the traditional media elites and speak directly to the American people. And we now are on the throw or threshold of a new transfer uh, to a new era of, of a new medium, and that is the social networking, internet-based social networking uh, communication technology. A remarkable technology. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how Obama, as you all know, dominated that area. But think about the complexity of this. First of all, it's uncontrolled. Millions of people, hundreds of millions of people are able to communicate with one another without going through any sort of central filtering, without any sort of central messaging. It is remarkably complex. And it allowed President Obama, because he was one of the early people to understand this, allowed him to communicate very directly with voters, bypassing, again, the traditional media, bypassing the traditional kind of messaging that, you, what, that one would see on the media, and, and, and to reach people directly to get his message out and also to raise money in, in, large, in large sums. So the internet has now become a thoroughly dominant force, or is on the verge of becoming a thoroughly dominant force, I would say. This particular chart was from Pew Research last year asking people how they got information about the campaign. TV was still the chief most important device of, of medium and platform for that. 72% said they got information from television. But by now, a third said they used the internet to get information. The internet had actually eclipsed newspapers and radio as, as recently as last year. And what's most important is if you look at the bullet points, the number citing the media had tripled since 2004. Half of the millennials, so while only a third of the general public said they used the internet, half of the millennials used the internet. So that meant that the general public, other than millennials, was somewhere down in the 20%. So it, it was a clearly dominant way of millennials using, getting political information. And finally, I think most important, a majority of millennials, about 60%, said the internet was their favorite platform. They might have used TV. Some of them might have even used radio and newspapers, although not many. But certainly, millennials were using TV. But they were definitely using the internet. They definitely liked the internet. That was their favorite way of, getting communica of, of obtaining political communication, getting political information. And you can see that, given the change in this area, how this is going to go in the future. It's, it's only going to increase the importance of the internet even more. One of the ways that we can actually demonstrate how the importance of the internet, but also how well Barack Obama utilized the internet, was with what was developed by a company called Spartan Research. And they developed their, what they called the SIPP index, S-I-P-P, -P, which if you can see stands for Spartan Internet Political Performance Index. Having done a lot of work for most of the last 20 odd years in my life in television, I can tell you a little bit about TV ratings. And what you try to do is you put a box in somebody's home, or in the old days, you actually had a diary that they tried to fill out. 
And it's really, in some ways, not very complicated. It was complicated to try to get people to watch, but the measurement techniques were fairly straightforward because you only had one or two questions to answer. Either the set's on or it's off. Somebody's watching. They're not watching a channel. That's really pretty much the only questions you have. With the internet, it's far more complex. And so what the, SIP, or the Spartan company was able to do was take a, an algorithm looking at about 650 different measures because you can contact people in so many different ways. They can contact campaigns through going to news websites, campaign websites, blogs. There's just any number of ways that this, this particular uh, medium, medium works. And the SIP index tried to measure the impact of all of these particular ways in which the campaigns could communicate. It's somewhat weighted so that something like communicating with the campaign was actually given more weight than, than just going to a search engine and looking up Barack Obama, for example. But nevertheless, all of these things matter. You're only seeing a portion of this. This is the kind of the primary election campaign, and it's the share of contacts about for that that particular candidate had on the medium. I chose four candidates, but there really would be many more, of course, at that particular stage. The red line is Obama. You can see his share. Incre it was high from the very beginning. As early as July 2007, he was getting 20% of the internet contacts. By the time it all ended, at the end of the primary campaign when he won the nomination, it was close to 40% of the internet contacts of all types were Barack Obama's. Actually, the candidate who did the best other than Obama was Ron Paul, the libertarian Republican candidate, which only goes to speak to the importance of the, that it's not only the medium that makes a difference, but it's also the message and the messenger. And, and, and Paul did not have the, the proper message and the proper persona to appeal to the millennial generation. You see that Hillary eventually made some gains, eventually toward the end of the campaign bypassed Ron Paul, but never got close to Obama. And finally, just for comparison, John McCain never got into the ball game really in any meaningful way, I, even at the very end when he had already clinched the nomination by June of 2008, had only got about a 15 share. And the same thing persisted during the general election campaign. Essentially, even though McCain made a few gains toward the end, essentially Obama was getting about two-thirds of the internet share and McCain about a third by the end of the campaign. So total domination by Obama from beginning to end uh, of, of, the, of the new medium. And that helped Obama to dominate the money raising. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. But the blue bars represent how much money Obama, Clinton, and McCain raised in the primary campaign. The red bars above that were in the general election campaign after the primary. And you can see, again, from beginning to end, Obama, using the internet and as well as other more traditional means, was able to dominate the, the, the fourth M, the money M, of this, of this, uh, of this uh, election campaign as well. So the end result was that, obviously, Barack Obama won. But it was a, it, the sharpest generational divisions that we have seen in American history, probably at least since I would guess the New Deal, as Morley mentioned, we didn't have political polling in those era, that era, so we don't really know exactly what the GI generation, the last civic generation, how they voted. We're pretty sure they were overwhelmingly pro-Franklin Roosevelt, but what, at what levels, we don't know. But you can see that Barack Obama carried the millennial vote, 18 to 29 year olds, by about a two to one margin. The next oldest generation, the gener Generation X, was about evenly divided. And their traditional form, the baby boomers, were exactly evenly divided. And finally, the oldest people, 65 and older, the silent generation, actually gave a majority of their votes for John McCain. But the key number is that millennial generation with that two to one ma majority for Barack Obama. What's most important is this is not going to be a temporary phenomenon. This isn't just simply something that happened in 2008 or something that's only Barack Obama. This is, in fact, long-lasting. This chart represents party identification of young voters. And as Simon pointed out, young voters are not the same in every era and all time. In 2002, 18 to 29-year-olds actually were about evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats. Most of those, virtually all of those, Young voters were actually members of Generation X, which is kind of the Ronald Reagan Republican generation. And you can see that they gave the Republicans, if anything, an insignificant two-point lead. 
by 2004, as millennials first started to join the electorate in, their, in, in some numbers, the Democrats went up 37 to 34, still evenly divided, but going toward the Democrats. By 2007, when all young people are millennials, the Democrats were 52 to 30. So in just a three-year period, it looks like young people have changed totally. What has changed is the definition of young people. We have a new generation coming in, and that happens to be the millennial generation, and they are overwhelmingly Democratic. By 2008, again, the Democrats among millennials have a two-to-one lead. I can tell you from recent polling, that hasn't changed. It's still a greater than almost a two-to-one advantage uh, in party identification for the Democrats over the Republicans. What's important about that is once people formulate a party identification, they aren't likely to change it during the course of their lives. So you have this large generation that is going to go through life likely to be a Democratic generation. Uh, and just to give you, I'll give you a couple real quick figures. <clears throat> recent, most recent um, uh, daily cost survey indicates that overall the public had a six, was 68% favorable, 27% unfavorable toward Obama. Among millennials, that is 83 to 12. So it's virtually unanimous. Um, looking at the Democratic Party, overall, the public was 55% favorable, 38% unfavorable toward the Democrats. Among millennials, it's 64 27. Looking on the other hand, the Republicans, overall, it was 29% favorable for the whole population, 66% unfavorable. Millennials, 12% favorable, 80% unfavorable. So there's hardly any, any millennial, seriously, who has anything good to say about the Republican Party right now. So that is speaking to what is likely to happen in the future, because the final chart I want to show you is where the millennial population is going to be in this country in the future. 2008, only 41% of millennials, with that huge Obama lead, only 41% of millennials were eligible to vote. Millennials made up only 17% of the total electorate, or the total population. By 2012, 61% of millennials can vote. That'll be 24% of the population. 2016, again, 80% of millennials can vote, 30% of the, of, the, of the electorate. And by 2020, when there will only be one little age group, 17-year-olds who will still be millennials uh, in that generation will not be eligible to vote at that point. So 99% of the millennial generation will vote, and they will make up a third of the population. Again, if what is normal and what has happened historically with, with party identification, with voting behavior, as it has been with every other generation, the GI generation, for example, going through life, a large generation voting, having similar political identifications, similar political attitudes. And that is how the, the, we believe that the Democratic Party is likely to be the dominant force in American politics over the next 20 to 30 to 40 years. So I guess we will turn it over for questions at this point. Thank you.